this is as clear as day, that there is a definite departure from the faith from Vatican II on. Now, how are we to explain this? Is it that the Holy Ghost changed his mind? Is it now that all of a sudden we're more enlightened than we were in the past, so now we know better in 1962 to 1965, so now we can start worshiping with other religions? And we are should wake up and think, oh, other religions are better now and they're more or less good and praiseworthy and pleasing to God? Are we to imagine now that the sacramental forms aren't important, that we can just kind of, you know, it's the community that makes things valid, not what the priest says or does? I mean, that's the contradiction. How do we explain this? It's very simple. The church has been infiltrated. An enemy has done this. And the fruits of Vatican II as I'm speaking to the choir, all of you know this, are so apparent. How in, in, in so many countries, there's less than half of Catholics, less than 50% even go to church anymore. Wasn't all these changes supposed to make things better so we understand things better and it's going to bring more people in and make people more enthusiastic? It's been a disaster. Less people go to church. Yes, people now, that's the Mass is in the vernacular and facing the people. What is the Mass? I don't know. They couldn't tell you what the Mass is. They don't even know. Do they believe in a real presence? Everything that's been done in the Novus Ordo, communion in the hands, standing for communion, uh, the priest as a more of a presider over the assembly, that has dumbed people down to not believe in the real presence of Christ. And then we think of this ecumenism, this idea that we can worship with other religions and other religions are valid and their prayers to God are valid. Why be a Catholic? Why be a member of this church or this religion? Why not go to anywhere else and do something else? So we are very familiar with all this. But where do we come to today? We have today a myriad of people out there who call themselves Catholics. And what we'd like to do very simply is to give you a defense of how do you defend in this day and age the position that we take that Vatican II ushered in the apostasy, the modern church is not the Catholic church, and these men that are wearing white and living in the Vatican and calling themselves popes are not popes at all. Really, there's only there's five objections to what we call the Sede Vicantis position. And we're going to list these and then pass these out. The first is that Pope Pius XII, in his apostolic constitution, lifted all penalties to ensure valid election. And I, if I could find this very quickly here, this is the primary... Uh, argument in this magazine, The Rock. This came out March 2001, The Rock. It's an apologetic, Catholic apologetics in evangelization. And it says, can the chair of Peter be vacant? The whole thrust of this article is the Pope lifted all penalties. So it doesn't matter what those cardinals are. They can be heretics. They can be schismatics. They can be Freemasons. It doesn't matter. They're going to get elected. If they're elected, they're the Pope, period. And there's a, a little cliche here. I could find it quickly. It says, uh, white smoke, valid pope. So as soon as that white smoke comes up, he's it. Okay, we have another objection. And that is that um, the chair of Peter cannot be vacant. for so long. Can't be done. There's been not times in which there's no Pope for a year or three years or two years, but not 40 or 50. That can't be done. Another would, argument would be that no Pope equals no Cardinals equals no future Pope. So you're, you can't have a Pope in the future, so you can't be the Catholic Church. That can't be right. Oh, there's another one, and that is with regard to 
that maybe these Vatican II popes, maybe, are only materially heretical. Meaning, they mean well, they're just mistaken. You know, they just, they just don't get it right. And I don't know what's the matter with them, but they're not getting it right. And, you know, they're, they're really sincere, and they're trying. And I see them sometimes carrying a rosary, so there has to be hope for them, etc., etc. And that would be a, another objection. And then one last one would be that even if, even if formally heretical, they, d they say, you must have a declaration. Somebody has to declare it. Until he's declared, he's still the Pope. So we've la laid out the five objections to the study of Econda's position. What I'd like to do, with the help of Brother Sebastian, is pass these booklets out. And get some other helpers too here. Now, I printed out a hundred. Yeah, so you might have to go two to. Uh, what we're going to do after this is we're going to go into the issue of jurisdiction. We're trying to cover all the bases on this. We're going to do this very quickly. But uh, maybe you can just share these booklets here. While these are being passed out, I'd like to just tell you one thing. When people ask me a question, I don't want to give them my opinion, but I want to tell them what, this is what the church has taught, this is what the church teaches, this is not my opinion, this is what we find in theology books and dogmatic theology books, this is what the popes have taught, these are what the doctors of the church have taught, these are what theologians teach, this is not my opinion. So hopefully anybody missing one or can't see come to can't see it. Maybe over here. One over here. Miss Narelle there. One over here. Okay, let's open up the page one, skip the table of contents, because we've already covered the objections here. Objection one. Pope Pius the twelfth lifted all ecclesiastical penalties during the conclave to elect a pope. So even if the Vatican II popes were heretics before their elections, they would still be validly elected. The answer is very simple. Heretics and schismatics are barred by divine law from the election of the papal, to the papal office. Pope Pius XII lifted ecclesiastical penalties. He did not, would not, could not dispense from divine law. This is the proof that we have now. This, uh, from the Institution of Canon Law, 1950, Coronata, what is required by divine law for this appointment is that the one elected be a member of the church. Hence, heretics and apostates, at least public ones, are excluded. Once again, Institutions of Canon Law by Morato, 1921, heretics and schismatics are barred from the supreme pontificate by the divine law itself. Now this next one, very, very important. This is Pope Paul IV in 1559. If, even if it should ever appear that any bishop, even a Roman pontiff, has beforehand deviated from the Catholic faith or fallen, from the, fallen into heresy, we enact, decree, determine, define such promotion or election in and of itself, even with the agreement and unanimous consent of all the cardinals shall be null, legally invalid and void, neither through reception of office, consecration, subsequent administration or possession, nor even through the putative enthronement of a Roman pontiff himself, together with the veneration and obedience accorded unto all. And it goes on to say that everything is null and void. Even it should not become valid through a lapse of time. Uh, each and every words, all his laws, appointments, etc., will be lacking in any force. The last very last sentence, those so promoted or elected by that very fact and without the need to make any further declaration 
shall be deprived of any dignity, position, honor, title, authority, office, and power. I like to say something about this. There have been some who would claim, tried to write this in a little bit different uh, ink here, some would say that the 1917 Code of Canon Law supersedes this. They'll say that, well, this may have been legislation in 1559, but now we go by the 1917 Code. Well, in order to interpret the Code, when we look at the canons in the original Latin text, there are footnotes to the canons. What are those footnotes there for? The footnotes are there to help us to, to interpret the canon correctly. And there's a canon, 188, number 4. 188 says that if someone has an office, a position within the Catholic Church, they automatically, tacitly are, are removed from that office and without a declaration being needed, and number four is if they, if they publicly defect from the faith. And what do they give as the reference to this canon 188, number four? In the footnote in the official code, it says, cum ex apostolatus, this very decree of Pope Paul IV in 1559. This is the source of the 1917 code 188, number 4. And we also have C. Baldi. I'm not sure if there's a relative of, uh, of uh, Amy, but we're not sure. Maybe. <laughs> Once again, the institution of canon law in 1929. The law now enforced for the election of the Roman pontiff is reduced to these points. Bard is incapable of being validly elected are the following. Women children who have not used, reached the age of reason, those who suffer from habitual insanity, the unbaptized, heretics, and schismatics. So the issue is this. Given all the false ecumenism and all the public worship of non-Catholics and non-Christian religions and all these ecumenical endeavors that they've done, this is as Pope Pius the 11th says in Mortali Manimos, apostasy. And these men, by their acts of apostasy, are not members of the Catholic Church. They can't be elected. But there's something further, and this is the, the key thing, and I believe it's primarily the infallibility of the Catholic Church. How can we say we believe in the attribute of infallibility of the Church and then be confronted with the official teachings of Vatican II and the subsequent years of constantly repeating these teachings of Vatican II of ecumenism, ecumenism, ecumenism. Where is the infallibility of the Church? How could this be the Catholic Church? They are not teaching infallibly. They're contradicting, starkly contradicting, the very first commandment of God. I want to throw something out, not to get off into a tangent, but just very briefly... All of you have heard of Our Lady of La Salette. When Our Lady appeared to Melanie Maximin at La Salette, France, she gave them a secret. That secret was committed to Pope Pius IX. While they were writing out the secret, they either asked for the meaning or the spelling of one or two words. The two words that we know was they wanted to know about Antichrist and also infallibility. There were two words, Antichrist and infallibility, this is in the book, Light on the Mountain, by this Father Kennedy. He wrote this, I believe, in the 1940s, long before there was a Vatican II and anything else like that. The two words the children, when they were writing out the secret, wanted to know or spell were Antichrist infallibility. And when Pope Pius IX read the secret, he said to those with him, all the more must we define papal infallibility. And my dear friends in Christ, that is the key issue. People accuse us of saying, well, you don't believe in the Pope. It is because we believe in the Pope, it's because we believe in the papacy, because we believe in the infallibility of the church, we can't acknowledge these men to be true popes. These men do not speak with the voice of Christ. Christ said, he who hears you hears me. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And that can't be with these modern so-called popes. They can't be contradicting the first commandment. They can't be uh, contradicting what their predecessors have taught. 
infallibly taught. But like I say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Why can't people see it? It's not because they can't. I think with some people they won't. But maybe we can say can't because it's a matter of grace. So we've gone through lifting of penalties. Now we get to this next one. The chair of Peter can't be vacant for such a long time. How many have heard that before? Oh, there's no way. Can't have a pope for that. No pope for that long. Objection number two. Vatican Council I taught that St. Peter has perpetual successors. Therefore, long vacancies in the Sea of Peter are not possible. You know, the first question they ask people, okay, well then where does the church teach that it can't be this amount of years and it has to be this amount of years and it can't be that amount of years? Nowhere. Nowhere does the church determine how long a vacancy may exist in the Sea of Peter. The point of the matter is, is this. The office is always existing. There's not always an incumbent, someone occupying that office, and that's the point. Between the death of Pope Clement IV, 1268, and the election of Pope Gregory X, 1271, there was an interregnum of nearly three years. During the Western Schism, there were three men three claimants to the Sea of Peter. Theologians teach that even if none of them were Pope, that would not be against the promise of Christ or the teachings of perpetual successors. Now we read the proof. This is from Reverend Deutsch, the Institutions of Fundamental Theology. The Church, therefore, is a society that is essentially monarchical, but this does not prevent the Church for a short time after the death of a Pope or even for many years from remaining deprived of her head. And this is, the next one is the relations of the church to society, Father Edward J. O'Reilly, S.J. And this is after Vatican II, or excuse me, after Vatican I in 1870, 12 years after Vatican I, when infallibility was defined and perpetual successors was defined. This is what Father O'Reilly says. In the first place, there was all throughout the death of Gregory, the 11th and 1378, a Pope. This is when he's talking about three men claiming to be Pope, the Western Schism. With the exception, of course, of the intervals between the deaths and elections to fill up the vacancies thereby created. There was, I say, at every given time a Pope, really invested with the dignity of the Vicar of Christ and the head of the Church. Whatever opinions might exist among many as to ingenuineness, not that an interregnum covering the whole period would have been impossible or inconsistent with the promises of Christ, for this is by no means manifest. So even if for nearly 40 years there was no Pope, that's not against the promise of Christ. Father uh, Hill, S.J., The Catholics Ready Answer, 1915, if during the entire schism, nearly 40 years, there had been no Pope at all, that would not prove that the office and authority of Peter was not transmitted to the next Pope duly elected. The Defense of the Church, a Catholic Church by Doyle. The Church is a visible society with a visible ruler. If there can be any doubt about who that visible ruler is, he is not visible, and hence, where there is any doubt about whether a person has been legitimately elected Pope, that doubt must be removed before he can become the visible head of the Christ Church. Blessed Bellarmine, S.J., says, a doubtful Pope must be considered as no Pope, and Suarez, S.J., at the time of the Council of Constance, there were three men claiming to be Pope. Hence, it could have been that not one of them was true Pope, and in that case, there was no Pope at all. So this issue about there can't be such a long time without a Pope, that's not a valid argument. We have the next uh, objection. Even if all the Vatican II Popes were invalid, if they were all invalid, then there would be no cardinals to elect a future Pope, thus the papacy would come to an end, which is impossible. So no Pope, no cardinals, no future Pope. How do you answer that? Answer, during the Western Schism, three men claimed to be Pope. The true Pope in Rome, the one in Avignon, one in Pisa. In order to heal the nearly 40-year schism, the Council of Constance determined that with all the cardinals, delegates from each country would participate in the papal election, the elected Pope Martin V. Theologians teach that in doubt or in absence of cardinals, the Church has the right to choose its head. Now, when I say the Council of Constance determined with all the cardinals, 
That's cardinals from all three groups, Rome, Avignon, Pisa. Now, obviously, not all of them could have been cardinals. They weren't sure. There was not an agreement amongst all of them who the true pope was, who the true cardinals were, etc., etc. But they said, okay, we'll get all the cardinals remaining from all three groups, but we'll take delegates from each country, and they all have to agree on the same person. The proof of this, De Potestati Ecclesiae, Victoria, even if St. Peter would not have determined anything once he was dead, the church had the power to substitute him and appoint a, su a successor to him. If by calamity, war, or plague, all cardinals would be lacking, we cannot doubt that the church we cannot doubt that the church could provide for herself a holy father. Hence, such an election should be carried out by all the church, and not by any particular church. And this is because that power is common and concerns the whole church. So it must be the duty of the whole church. And Caradis Cajetan, the Dominican, by exception or by supplementary manner, this power, that of electing a pope, corresponds to the church and to the council either by the absence of the cardinal electors or because they are doubtful, or the election itself is uncertain, as it happened at the time of the schism, the, w the Western schism. Balat, when it is necessary to proceed with the election, if it is impossible to follow the regulations of papal law, as was the case during the great Western schism, one can accept without difficulty that the power of election could be transferred to a general council because natural law prescribes that in such cases the power of the superior is passed to the immediate inferior because this is absolutely necessary for the survival of society and to avoid the tribulations of extreme need. This is Monsignor Charles Journet, the Church of the Incarnate Word, the Church during the vacancy of a Holy See. We must not think of the Church when the Pope is dead as possessing the papal power in act. It is in a state of diffusion so that she can she herself can delegate it to the next pope in whom it is to be recondensed and made de definite. When the pope dies, the church is widowed, and in respect to the visible universal jurisdiction, she is truly acephalous, headless. But she is not acephalous as are the schismatic churches, nor like the body that on the way to decomposition, Christ directs her from heaven. But though slowed down, the pulse of life has not left the church. She possesses the power of papacy and potentia. And then we go along a little bit further on. During a vacancy of the apostolic see, neither the church nor a council can contravene the provisions already laid down to determine the valid mode of election. However, in case of permission, for example, if the Pope has provided nothing against it, and this is where we bold the letters, or in case of ambiguity, for example, if it is unknown who the true cardinals are or who the true Pope is, as was the case in the time of the great schism, the power of applying the papacies as such and such a person devolves on a universal church, the Church of God. Okay, everybody's still persevering here. We're not burning you out, wearing you out. Okay, we've got two more objections, then we'll take a break, and then there's one more thing we want to cover here. Objection four. Even if the Pope fell into heresy, he would remain Pope until the Church declared him a heretic and no longer Pope. Answer, Pope Paul IV and cum ex apostolatus Pope Innocent III and see Papa and theologians teach that a heretical pope is deposed by God. Proof, we have from the bull, we've already read this, of Paul IV. If ever it shall appear that any bishop or even the Roman pontiff has deviated from the Catholic faith and fallen into heresy, we enact, decree, determine, etc., etc., on page 6. And it goes on to say, those promoted or elected by that very fact and without the need to make further declaration shall be deprived of dignity, position, honor, title, office, uh, authority, office, and power. Pope Innocent III in 1198. Still less can the Roman pontiff glory because he can be judged by men, or rather, he can be shown to be already judged. If, for example, he should wither away into heresy, because he who does not believe is already judged. Coronata 1950. He, the Roman pontiff, would by divine law fall from office without any sentence. Indeed, without even a declaratory one. He who openly professes heresy places himself outside the church and it is not likely that Christ would preserve the primacy of his church and so one so unworthy. St. Robert Bellarmine, a pope who is a manifest heretic, automatically ceases to be pope and head, just as he ceases automatically to be a Christian and a member of the church. St. Antoninus, 
In the case in which the Pope would become a heretic, he would find himself by that very fact alone without any other sentence separated from the Church. St. Francis de Sales, now when the Pope is explicitly a heretic, he falls ipso facto from his dignity and out of the Church. We can go on and on and on. We have Ernst Vidal and Beste and Vermeersch. They keep repeating the same thing. Manifest notorious heresy automatically falls from his power. Okay. Lastly, uh, we kind of got these mixed up here, uh, four and five, but the Vatican II popes might just be materially heretical. The Vatican II popes are not guilty of formal heresy, but only material heresy. Therefore, they would not lose their office. Answer, the distinction between material heresy and formal heresy is not considered in this issue of the loss of papacy by one who falls into heresy. Canon law, theologians, they all refer to public manifest heretics. They don't get into the distinctions. Why? Someone could be a material heretic. Let's say you have some pious person who really doesn't know their faith very well. They're very simple-minded, and they might believe in one thing or another, but they certainly believe all that the Catholic Church teaches. They might be mistaken. They might materially be denying something the Church teaches, but not formally or intentionally. How can you excuse these men that have degrees in theology, that have been priests and been in the church for years and years and years, not know the first commandment, not know that it's a sin against faith to worship with other religions, not to know that it's apostasy from the faith. I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you excuse them? You can't. So when we look at these proofs here, we have Canon Law 188, number 4, there are certain clauses which affect the tacit resignation of an office, which resignation is accepted in advance by the operation of law, and hence is effect without any declaration. These causes are, number four, if someone publicly defects from the, from the faith. St. Robert Bellarmine, a pope who is a manifest heretic, automatically ceases to be pope and head. Vernes Vidal, public heresy. Feste, manifest notorious heresy. Coronata, Heretics and apostates, at least public ones, are excluded. Nowhere that they talk about material and formal, because if the man has been elected pope, you have to presume he knows his stuff. He's not stupid. He knows his theology. And for him to deny the faith or fall into heresy, uh, you can't excuse it as, well, he means well, but he's just mistaken. It just doesn't follow. So, listen, you are welcome to keep these books. 